In this video, I'm showing you all of my camera gear and all of the settings that I use with that camera gear to film cinematic football videos. Hey, what's going on? My name is Peter Sorellis. I'm a videographer and editor from Toronto, Canada. I specialize in sports videography and with the football season here in Canada coming up really quickly, I'm getting ready to start shooting football games again on a regular basis. And that kind of got me thinking about all the gear that I need to have prepared in order to go back out in the field and be filming football games every week all summer long. So I figured now that I'm getting all this stuff in order, it's a great time for me to show you all the gear that I use and talk about the settings that I use with that gear to get the best results possible possible when I'm filming football games. I did a video like this a long time ago that's fairly similar for basketball videos. If I were to have done this video back then, the videos probably would have been too similar, but my kit has changed a lot since that video a couple years ago, and my filming style has changed as well, at least I think. So I feel like this is a worthwhile update, and the thing that in my mind makes the most sense to start with is the cases or the bags that are gonna be carrying all of this gear. So let's start with that. So I've got two main cases, I guess, that I'm using to carry out my camera gear this year. We've got this, which probably doesn't fit on the screen. I hope this does, which is the Nanak 935. It's a big, like basically camera case. You open it up and it's all padded on the inside and it fits all your different stuff. I had this Nanic 935 case on my wish list actually for a minute and then my work ended up getting it and letting me use it for when I'm traveling this summer filming games, which is awesome. And it has like a whole padded interior where I can put like lenses and camera bodies and just everything. And then a few pockets underneath the lid where I can put like batteries, SD cards, small tools, different things like that. I'm actually super excited to start using it because my biggest gripe with having to travel to film a game in the past was that I pack up this backpack, which I still use and is a great backpack but it gets absolutely torn apart by security because they can't find everything easily. So now that I have a big bag that I can actually lay everything in, it's gonna hopefully make my airport experience a lot easier. And then the other thing that I'm using to carry all my camera gear is this camera backpack. This is the Brevite jumper. And I was actually sent to me like about a year ago maybe. And there was like no money exchanged or anything like that. But they basically said, take this, see if you like it. I tried it out for a little bit and I haven't stopped using it since. It's amazing for travel. I like that it has this little strap here on the back so I can actually hook it over top of the handle that comes out of the Nana case that I just showed you and then roll all of my stuff around at once. This is gonna be really good for like, if I have the odd lens that has to get thrown in here, or like the odd camera body that I just wanna keep on me while I'm like on the plane and I don't wanna to have to put it in the overhead. I wanna have it like actually accessible or keep my laptop in here. It's gonna be really useful for that type of stuff. And then obviously just like clothes and personal hygiene items and the regular things you have to travel with if you're going to film a game. Next up, let's talk about all the cameras that I'm using to film football games this year. And the first one is actually one that you're not gonna suspect if you've been watching this channel for a little bit. And that's the Sony FX3. Yeah, I got one. No, it was given to me through my work specifically to use to film football games for the CFL this summer. And I've been using it a little bit here and there just to film other stuff in the off season, like interviews and training camps and things of that nature. But I haven't extensively put this camera to the test yet when filming an actual game. And I'm really excited to do so because 4K 120, at ISO 12,800 is going to be a game changer at nighttime if you're pointing this thing in a part of the stadium that isn't very well lit. So really excited to get this out into the field. And then of course, I also have the Sony FX30, which is actually right over here. I'm just filming with it right now as my B cam, but I'm still gonna be using this for a lot of game action. I intend on bringing it with me a lot because it's Awesome. There's just no reason to leave this thing at home because it's super capable. Put you back right there. And then the last camera that I'm using is my Sony a7 IV. And this season, the a7 IV is going to mostly be my gimbal cam. So I'll use it pre-game and post-game to get dynamic moving shots, probably with a wide lens. I don't really see myself using it in game that much, even though it's a super capable camera when it is an A cam, like how I used it all of last year. I just don't really need it between the FX3 and the FX30, but it's gonna be really nice to just have a camera that's on a gimbal ready to go at any time so that I can grab it and get a different look than 
the telephoto lenses that are going to inevitably end up being on these two cameras. Now speaking of lenses, let's talk about them. The first lens that I'm going to be using this season, and this is no surprise to anyone, is the Sony 70 to 200 millimeter f4. I love this lens. I think it's perfect for sports. If you use it on a crop center like the FX30, you get amazing reach for football. And even if you want to shoot things a little bit wider and capture the full action on a full frame camera like the FX3, it's sweet. The autofocus on this is fantastic. It's affordably priced. I've talked about this lens forever. If you don't have one and you shoot sports as your main thing, you should have one. It's just great. I don't, I won't go to film a game without this in my bag. And then another very similar lens that I'm going to be using this year is actually the Sony 70 to 200 millimeter F 2.8. Mark one, and that's the lens that I got through work to use for games this summer. I won't have it all the time, and I'm just gonna sprinkle it in here and there. And it's actually, in my opinion, gonna be pretty useful for when I'm using the FX30 because there are some situations where I need to open the aperture up to f2.8, and it helps get a little bit more light in there considering the dual base ISO at 2500 on the FX30 isn't nearly as strong as the FX3, which is an absolute monster in low light when you're shooting in uncontrolled environments like at an arena where you just don't control the lighting. So now it is heavier and bulkier to carry around. And I don't love that. And I don't think the autofocus really offers much improvement, if any, compared to this guy right here. But still, it's a good tool to have. And I'm gonna use it sometimes. Another like even more telephoto lens that I used a little bit last year, but I just kind of used it a touch to the point that I didn't even feel the urge to talk about it much was the Sony 100 to 400 f 4.5 to 5.6. That's the lens that's going to give me all of those really nice emotion shots with the creamy blurry backgrounds. Now I usually shoot handheld and I can't do that obviously with a 100 to 400 if I'm going to zoom it all the way in. Now using a monopod is something that I do on occasion so maybe I'll have to do that when I'm using the 100 to 400. But either way, I think that lens is going to be really nice to change things up from the 70 to 200 look. And then when I want to go a little bit wider, I have the Tamron 28 to 75 millimeter f 2.8. And this is just like a great all around zoom lens. 28 is nice and wide in case someone's coming right at you. 75 is like tight enough that you can at least get a medium shot of someone if they're coming kind of close to you. And f2.8 all the way through is just perfect. This lens has great autofocus performance. It's sharp. So this is actually the newer version of the Tamron 28 to 75 f2.8. There's an old one that doesn't have like the ridges in it like this one does. And it doesn't have the custom function button like this one does, which I like using as a focus hold button. And I'm going to use that lens most often if I need a smaller compact setup when shooting pre-game or post-game stuff. So maybe I want to like get into a huddle and I can't bring a whole gimbal in because it's going to take up too much space and I'm surrounded by guys. So I got to grab like my Sony FX3 with a 28 to 75 and just get really tight and squeeze in there and zoom out 28 mil and get my shot. That's what that lens is going to be for most of the time. And then of course, when I'm on the gimbal with the a7 IV, I'm going to be using the Sony 20 millimeter F 1.8. Literally the a7 IV and the 20 mil 1.8 is a setup that I use all the time. I'm absolutely milked this last season for pre-game and post-game shots and got some pretty cool stuff. It's kind of like that 8K gimbal look that was being advertised so long ago on Fox and that now like every live broadcast seems to be doing. So that's my way of replicating that for not too much money, I guess. So the gimbal that I'm rocking for my gimbal setup is actually the original DJI Ronin S, not the RS2 or the RS3 or any of these newer fancier gimbals that have come out. And those gimbals are fantastic. But the original DJI Ronin S that I have just works. Like it's a good gimbal, it balances the camera. I don't know what more I could ask for. So I just keep using it and it keeps serving me well. <laughs> that's really bad. Now for audio, I'm rocking the Rode NTG3 and this is a really sweet XLR mic that has been provided to me through work. So I'm using it exclusively for CFL games this summer. And this is actually an awesome microphone, not only for capturing dialogue or people talking at you, I guess, in the field, but also for like when you're doing interviews and stuff, I've been using this for a bunch of interviews in the off season and it has sounded super crisp. I'm just really happy with it. And I'm running it straight into the XLR top handle right here that is going to be living on top of the Sony FX3 for most of the games that I'm filming. 
and then kind of my alternate, like not provided by work, but my audio setup that I'm also gonna be rocking for games is the Rode VideoMic NTG. I'm using it right now, as you can see right here for this YouTube video. Let's make sure I get that out of the shot. And this mic is also super sweet for capturing ambience and things of that nature when you're in the field and it plugs in with a 3.5 millimeter jack. So even when I don't have this top handle accessible, I can just run it right into the side of the FX30 or the A7 IV and it's not an issue. It sounds better than putting on like one of those little video micro things. That's like 50 bucks. So I'm trying not to use those anymore. This is a bit of an upgrade from that. And obviously this is the biggest upgrade. And the SD cards that I'm shooting on are the SanDisk Extreme Pro V90 SD cards that write at 300 megabits per second. So I have like a bunch of these because they let me do 4K 120 and 10 bit color on the FX3 and the FX30. So I've got two on my personal account and then I got another two in the work camera, the FX3 as well. And I'm basically like always locked and loaded with a bunch of these things so that no matter what, I can just roll and roll and roll and it's not an issue. And that, that's not to say I'm rolling in 4K 120 all the time because I think that's excessive. And again, we're gonna talk about settings in a bit. I don't always film on external monitors when I'm shooting, but when I do use an external monitor, I usually use the Andy Cine A6 Plus. I can load LUTs into it. It has a whole bunch of great options for looking at your footage and actually monitoring the exposure. You can do like the grid lines and all that different type of stuff and add different overlays to it. So overall, I would just say this is like a great option and it just takes like your regular Sony battery in the back. And you know, as a Sony user, like I obviously have an absolute ton of these things. And then finally we have filters. So there's only really two types of filters that I'm using nowadays. And I think I'm gonna get a couple more, which I might talk about in a future video. But for now, I'm just rocking the Tiffin variable ND filter. So I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but an ND filter is basically just sunglasses for your camera. And this one, you just twist it and it gets darker and lighter so that you can make sure that your image is exposed properly. And I basically only put this on my camera when I need to reduce the amount of light hitting my sensor so that I can shoot at one of the base ISOs of my camera. So that's what I use this thing for. And it's just really easy to pop on and pop off. I have the 82 millimeter thread size and some step up rings that let me get to the same thread size on every single camera. So I can just screw this on and screw this off. And then I have the Tiffin Promis filter, which I actually have one Promis filter on each of the cameras that are rolling right now. So let me just pop this off. And there's the Promis filter. Probably doesn't look like it does a whole lot. It looks like a clear filter, but it just gives your shots like more of that glowy, dreamy look. If you shoot a Promis filter right into a light, you'll see it kind of blooms and the softness is very evident. Not that it's like not sharp, but it doesn't have a lot of that digital sharpness, which I really like. So I use the quarter strength Promist, which is pretty heavy. I know a lot of people use the one eighth strength, but I think that they're both really solid. I just know everyone gets the one eighth. So I got the one quarter to be a little different and make my stuff stand out. And you know what? I liked it so much, I bought it twice. So if that's not a good testament, then I don't know what is. So now that we've talked about all the gear that I use to film football videos, let's talk about all the settings that I use. And the first setting I wanna talk about is ISO. So whether I'm using the FX3, the FX30, or the 874, I'm always shooting at a base ISO. So that's 812,800 on the FX3, 830,200 on the A7 IV, 825,000 on the FX30 when filming an S-Log3. I'll always make sure that I'm at one of those ISOs and if I need to get more light into my image to make sure that I can use one of those ISOs, then I'll do so by swapping my lenses out, for example, using a 70 to 200 f2.8 instead of the f4, or I'll put this variable ND filter on to allow me to boost my ISO higher in case there's too much light hitting my sensor. For my aperture, when I'm using a telephoto lens, assuming that I'm not changing to a telephoto lens that has a faster aperture so that I can get more light into my image, for the purpose of maintaining my ISO, then I'm gonna usually shoot at f4 because telephoto lenses already give you a pretty shallow depth of field, so I don't feel like I need to open up my aperture to get an even shallower one. And having a little bit of room where things are in focus helps make sense of what's happening in a sports video, especially when the action is really far away. So I'm actually pretty happy to shoot at f4 a lot of the time for that. And then when I'm using a wider lens where I don't have a shallow depth of field naturally, just from the lens. I'm gonna usually be shooting at f2.8 or lower, so obviously with the Tamron set 28 to 75, f2.8, 
I'm shooting that at f2.8. And then if I'm using a prime lens like the 20, I won't shoot it at f1.8 because the image does get sharper as you stop down. So I'll usually shoot the 20 mil f1.8 on the gimbal at f2.2. And I find that gives me a pretty sharp image while still letting in more than enough light and giving me that nice blurry background look. So for shutter speed, I'm over cranking my shutter when I'm filming to one over 320 or one over 400 usually. So if we're talking in shutter angle, this means I'm going below a 180 degree shutter angle. And I do this to get less motion blur in my image. It gives me a speedier, more jittery, fast paced type of look to my videos. And when I'm filming a hard hitting action sport like football, I think this is a really effective way to film. I will sometimes drop to 180 degree shutter angle, which is one over 125 in 60 frames per second or one over 250 in 120 frames per second. Either one, if I need to, in order to expose my image properly as like a last resort, or if there's an actual legitimate reason for it, like maybe I'm filming a coach talking in a huddle and we just don't need our shutter to be cranked super high to make that look like a high intensity action moment because it's not. And then I'll shoot at one over 50 if I'm filming in 24 frames per second because if I'm choosing to film in 24 frames per second for something, again, an example would be like a coach in a huddle or something of that nature. If I don't intend on slowing it down and I'm actually capturing dialogue, then I just want that to look natural like you're actually watching it as a person and can see real motion blur. So that's kind of my logic for that. But any game action, I'm definitely over cranking my shutter. For my frame rates and video modes, I'm shooting in 120 frames in S and Q mode on the A7 IV pretty much all the time when I'm filming pre-game or post-game. I'll sometimes switch to 4K 60 in just regular video mode capturing audio if I know I'm gonna get nice and close to a player who's very expressionate or has a bit more of a personality and likes interacting with the camera because sometimes you'll get cool sound bites that you're gonna to wanna to use. So when I'm filming the game, I'm actually a lot of the time using 4K 60 frames per second and this is all with 10 bit color. But I do this because 4K 120 just takes up a ton of memory and you don't go back and actually use most of the plays you film in a game as silly as that sounds football games are just really long and there's usually just a couple key definitive moments that lead to a score or change the outcome of a game that you end up looking back on so a lot of the time i'm in 4k 60 and then when there's a potential for a key moment coming up for example a team gets into the red zone or maybe we're in the second half of the fourth quarter and it's crunch time. Then I switch to 4K 120 and film everything in 120 frames per second to make sure that when that key moment does happen, I capture it in as many frames as possible and I have all the flexibility to slow it down as much as I need to. You're probably wondering how I'm able to switch between frame rates and different video modes and that stuff so quickly when a football game is actually happening. So I actually set up memory recall presets that let me just switch between 24 frames per second, 60 frames per second, and 120 frames per second with just the click of a button. I've done a video talking all about my memory recall presets for the a7 IV. If you like that video and it's applicable to you, go check it out. If you wanna see a video going over my memory recall presets for the FX30 or the FX3, let me know and I can put that together as well. For autofocus, I'm using autofocus continuous as you'd expect for someone shooting video with a wide focus zone and I'll often either have press the shutter to hold my focus if I'm filming a certain player who's fairly stagnant or not really coming forwards and backwards towards my camera and someone walks in front of my shot. That way it doesn't like focus hunt a little bit. And I'll also use touch tracking autofocus a lot of the time. So I'll like touch the screen and then it'll track the player's eye as he's running a route or as he's standing there getting ready to throw the ball and no matter what happens, that player is gonna stay in focus and I'm gonna just have them in my shot the entire time. For my white balance, obviously if I'm filming a game that's during the day, like when the sun's out, I'm gonna be filming at 5600 Kelvin. And as the nighttime sets in, I usually put myself at around like 4500 Kelvin, give or take a few hundred in either direction, depending on the stadium lights. I just find that this is like a really good middle ground and stadium lights aren't necessarily always even depending on where you point your camera because they may be hitting certain parts with more or less strength. But this is kind of like a good middle ground for me so that the white balance, no matter where I'm shooting at night with stadium lights is always pretty close. Now you're gonna have to make decisions based on your own experiences and what venue you're in. So I recommend getting to a place early and doing some tests if possible. 
but like that's kind of my rule of thumb if I'm not really sure what white balance to shoot at and I don't have time to do a test because maybe the lighting conditions have changed while I'm in the middle of a game, for example. Now, the last setting I want to talk about is my steady shot, which is like your in-camera stabilization for Sony cameras. And I usually have this set to active whenever possible. There are some frame rates and some filming modes where you can't have it set to active and that's fine, I just leave it on standard. But when I can set it to active, not only do I appreciate the stabilization that these cameras give you because steady shot is just really good, but I also appreciate the crop in that gets me closer to my action because when you're so far away from the action when you are in football, any reach helps, especially when you're filming handheld on a lens like this. So I'm able to, with that extra crop in, actually get tighter shots that I really like and get more stable footage, which is awesome. Anyways, bit of a long video, but that's all the camera gear and all the settings that I use with that camera gear to film cinematic football videos. If you like this video, please subscribe to the channel because I post videography and video editing tips, tutorial videos similar to this one on a regular basis. And I'd love to have you around for that. If you have any questions about anything we talked about here, please drop it in the comment section. I would love to answer what you have going on and have a discussion with you down there. And if you like the look that I have in my football videos, you can color your football videos like mine by using the football video LUT pack. It's three LUTs for S-Log3 and three LUTs for HLG3 and it's available on my website. You can check that out in the description. Anyways, that's going to be all for this one. So until next time, peace.